So this is color symbol, color symbolism in Dawn Blue Thumbelina, and I'm Juliana. And just to start, so I found this interview in Film Voices where Don Bluth said that he wanted to make a movie with important emphasis on the story and the audience identification. He wanted to include threat and horror, and then he wanted to rescue you. He wanted it to be even more artful and mature than Disney's movies. And this movie was intended to be for the whole range of human being. Because if you're asking somebody to sit through 90 minutes of animation, there has to be something to hold you there. Um, he also wanted to ask if animals had human intelligence, would they be moral or would they dominate one another like humans do? He wanted to present characters where the audience can clearly tell how they think, what their fears and dreams are, and how they interact with one another. All of this is to say, he was extremely intentional with what he put in this movie and what messages he wanted to send forward. And I say all of this because I want you all to know that everything I'm about to point out was thought through and done on purpose. So... That being said, Jesus Christ, there we go. I'm going to talk a little bit about color theory. So this is a uh, compilation of what the modern American college student thought in about the 60s about each of these colors. Um, and based on the many, many books that I read. And by many, I mean three. Um, so lighting affects the color's appearance, obviously, even though it doesn't affect the actual color of the objects itself, and our eyes know that and adjust for that. So we might not call a highlight on silver white, as we know it's only a result of the fact that the thing is silver. If lighting is a color, an object still appears as the color it is, even though the perceived hue, if you had removed it from this lighting, is a totally different color. And I'll be showing that throughout this presentation, I'll show you what the lighting has done to these colors by removing them from the environment. Um, and light and color influence a person's psychological reactions and physiological well-being, even on a non-visual basis. A color variety is psychologically best as a variety in stimulation is important. So people who are or attempt to be well-adjusted, and you know, generally are extroverts, tend to like colors overall, but warm colors specifically. They're usually receptive and open to outside influences, and their mental functions are rapid and highly integrated. Introverts may not care about colors or slightly prefer cool colors. They're split off from the outside world, they find it difficult to adapt to new circumstances and have trouble expressing themselves. People with nervous and mental disturbances are highly affected by color, and the meaning of color to them is very significant. But the answer to healing is not one color over another, it's individual by patient, and the entire rainbow can be beneficial if it appeals, and that's what I'm going to be showing in this presentation. So, red and yellow specifically have been used for centuries in healing, and red has more recently been proven to improve blood flow, which aids in a lot of healing processes. And of course, red is a warm color, it evokes warmth, heat, flames, um, and I'm going to be showing red as a good color, and warm colors as good colors, and how cool colors are generally going to be bad. Um, so, warm colors are more active, and cool colors are more passive, and similarly, light colors are active, while deep ones are passive. So, that being said, let's get into Thumbelina. So, we're going to start out with her family and friends. So, this is her mother. In several different versions of the story, she's described as a young wife or just a woman, um, which I read seven different versions of the story. Uh, she either wished very much, dearly wanted, or would love to have a child, but could not have obtained her wish or didn't know where to find one. So, in Don Blue's version, right, here she is. She's hinted as being a widow where she either lost her baby or could not conceive one, which is more in line with not being able to obtain her wish in my eyes rather than being just a woman who doesn't know where to get a baby. Um, so here she is. You can see that she's mainly in warm colors. She's happy, um, except for these sleeves. So these sleeves are her innermost layer and they're going to represent her innermost emotions. So they're this purple color. Um, in this because she is grieving over her husband and her baby and she does not yet have Thumbelina. Here she has Thumbelina and as you can see that color has changed to this lovely peach color. Here she's lost Thumbelina and it's back to this fuchsia purple. Uh, she goes to an old witch woman, old mother, or a fairy depending on the version, although Don Bluth gives her a good witch which is depicted as a human-sized fairy and is given the barley corn which grows the flower with Thumbelina in it. So, here's her even after, um, when she's, like, having a, oh, I hope she's going to be okay, and the color of her sleeves there are, again, that 
sad purple. So here are the farmyard animals. Thumbelina has just been born and everyone's super happy. And as you can see, her mom's colors are up at the top right up here. And, you know, she's overjoyed that she has Thumbelina. And all of the farmyard animals are too, except here's the thing. Here are the three colors that the farmyard animals are. This blue, because Thumbelina is sad, she doesn't belong, she feels isolated. This kind of gross gray color, because, um, you know, it's the the grays and the and the whites are going to represent like performance so they're all putting on a performance they're singing her a little song and dance and the red is happiness so they're all lovely and happy to see her but just because they're happy doesn't mean that thumbelina can't be sad so here she is her herself uh depending on the version sometimes she's a literal infant when she's born when she comes out of the flower and that's represented here in this version and a little bit in this version as well um, and sometimes she's a young woman, as she is in Dawn Bluth's version here. Um, the flower that she comes out of is reportedly a tulip, with red and yellow petals, but pretty much every version just sticks with the red, except for this one, which went with yellow. Um, and they say that it has a black- they say that it has a green center, but they go with black in Dawn Bluth's version, as you can see right up here. Um, so here she is, the red again, happiness. She is surfacing her mom's happiness when she's coming out of this red flower. She's got the white innocence performance. She's pretending to be happy so that her mom is happy. She's got this green tone and this and this blue skirt because, again, the inherent sadness of not belonging. And then she's got this lovely yellow gold hair because she is a she like tries to put on a cheerful persona. She wants to be happy. Um, here we are introduced to the concept of fairies. So depending on the version. Um, basically, they're all flower spirits. They're spirit of flower, angel of flower, flower's angel, guardian spirit of the flower, but Don Bluth go ahead and just, like, they're fairies. Um, so as you can see here, the king and the queen, uh, the queen is in this lovely red number, the, and their wings are both this golden color, and the, the queen is totally happy. They're having a wedding, she's overjoyed. The king... The reason that he appears in this blue is because Thumbelina is sad that she doesn't know anybody her size. She feels like she's never going to find love. There's no man her size, and she's like, damn, I wish I knew a man. Um, and so this is when she has her little song soon, um, where, as you can see at the top here, it goes from this... Uh, red and pink color palette on the on the right and then she steps to the left and it gets this darker blue color palette because she's uh, complaining about essentially not knowing a man yet um, and here at the bottom you can see her colors as contrasted to the fake king even though she's taking the spot of the queen she's looking at him um, she's these lovely bright warm tones but she's clasping her, her blue, her sadness, right in front of her. And the king behind her is in these very muted, as you can see, even though it's, he's supposed to be wearing um, the blue and the red with the, with the yellow wings, as you saw in the last scene, they all appear as green, as blue. Um, and that's because she doesn't know anybody yet, so she's, she's sad about it. But that's okay, because Cornelius shows up. This is Cornelius, he's the prince. He's introduced right at the beginning, rather than at the very end of the story, as the fairy king or prince is in Hans Christian Andersen's version. And in Hans Christian Andersen's version, he's made of crystal or glass. Instead, in Don Bluth's version, he glows. He's golden. And that's important, because he's here to bring her happiness. He's here because he's happy, and he wants to make her happy, and he loves her. And he's very important to me because he represents everything that you're supposed to, um, you know, strive for and not settle for anything less. He asks for consent. He tells her what he would like to do for her as her partner, but not, doesn't say that he's going to do any of those things until she explicitly says that she's okay with that. Um, he makes a mistake, but he apologizes immediately. He corrects his behavior. 
Um, also, he doesn't change her name. In uh, Hans Christian Andersen's version, uh, he immediately like changes her name. He's like, oh, Thumbelina's a gross name. I'm naming you Maya, which is stupid. Um, Cornelius is every inch the caring, ideal partner, which is why he's the end goal. And it, it's important that he was introduced at the beginning. And as you can see on the left here, his color palette versus the pretend storybook man's color palette is so much brighter, so much better than she even imagined. So they have this song, Let Me Be Your Wings, right? And there is <laughs> a total of seven dramatic lighting changes in this. But so we can see her palette versus his color palette. Um, her skin is this like medium pink, whereas his is almost orange um, because he glows. And his like salmon colored top is a direct contrast to her pale blue skirt. So as you can see, as we go through here, her skirt, this is her before color palette and this is her after color palette once she's been with him for a little bit, um, her skirt turns pink. Everything else stays pretty much the same. Her hair gets a little warmer, her skin gets a little warmer, but that skirt turns purple pink. She is in love, she's happy. Um, and then his color palette actually gets muted. He goes down to reach her level so that he's no longer shining so much brighter than she is. Um, here we can see their before color palettes on the top and their current color palettes on the bottom. Um, you can see that there's a dramatic lighting shift as we go through here. Her skirt is back to blue. Um, he's dropped her out of the sky. Oops. But he catches her and then on the top here, this is his, this is his color palette right now, um, and his skin is yellow, <laughs> but she's overjoyed, they're happy, this is the ending, where again, her skirt has turned this, like, mauve purple tone, and he is supporting her completely, both hands, because before he only had one hand, and then he dropped her. Uh, so, let's get into Giacomo. Giacomo is a bird, and... He in he's a swallow specifically, and in the book he had a slightly different lesson to teach. He his role was to show you that nobody really helps you without ulterior motives. He develops feelings for Thumbelina, and then he proceeds to fly away when she marries the fairy prince because he either loved her or was quote fond of her, but either way he wanted to never part from her again. So Don Bluth has instead made him a very caring friend. You can see he's wearing this gold, this pink, these what is that like this rose blush uh he loves love he loves to be there for her he wants to be happy he's a super cheerful persona um but just because he is all of those things doesn't mean that he's going to meet her needs correctly uh, he makes things worse for Thumbelina throughout this movie and that's why he as himself as a bird is blue um and I actually found this out as that most birds are partially blind to blue but see red colors with remarkable clarity so he can't see that he's doing harm and is so focused on the red the bright the positive that he causes her pain so let's get into the lessons that she learned throughout this movie here are the toads um they're described in the books as uh there's a mother and a son toad and the mother is described as ugly great ugly great ugly slimy old withered large ugly wet horrid, hideous, and nasty, and horrible. And her son is described as ugly, uglier even than his mother, ugly and horrible, hideous and deformed, and frightful. And Don Bluth has made the only decision in this movie that I do not agree with, and has decided to make them into a mariachi band. I don't know why he did this. I don't approve. So, as you can see, the mother is dressed in pink when she kidnaps Thumbelina, and then once she you know, gets her to their little floating boat, uh, she removes the pink and reveals her green. She reveals that she's here for the money, she's here to trick people, she's here to convince Thumbelina into this life that she doesn't necessarily want. Um, her lips are pink because, still because she says a bunch of things that Thumbelina wants to hear. She says a bunch of things that make Thumbelina feel good, but overall she's green, she's blue, and she's fundamentally not supporting Thumbelina's needs and is making her sad. Uh, her sons, because in this version she has three sons for some reason, they're wearing 
this blue and weird swampy green and the two on the left are you know they don't really matter they're just there to intimidate her um, but the one on the right is the one who wants to marry her and he's wearing white and blue because he's sad but he is putting on this white of performance and he's pretending that he's happy he's, he's playing along with the band um but he he gets this straight up blue as opposed to the purple or blue of his brothers because he makes Thumbelina really upset so she escapes from the toads and immediately is accosted by Mr. Beetle and in the stories he is either described as a cockchafer, a maybug, or just a beetle and he's played by the guy who plays Iago who has recently passed away, Gilbert Gottfried unfortunately um, so in the story, he hums her play praises, he tells her that she's very pretty, even though she's not like a bug, um, and when he brings her home, there's a bunch of bugs who decide that she's not pretty, and depending on the version, either he comes around to how they feel and realizes she's not pretty, or he still thinks she's pretty, but he succumbs to the peer pressure and lets her go anyway. Um, and they make a point of being like, but Thumbelina was actually so pretty, like a rose petal. It doesn't matter. So Mr. Beetle, uh, in Don Bluth's version, is wearing all of this purple and indigo and dark blue. And he himself is also this pale blue. So he flatters Thumbelina, he tells her he loves her voice, and then he makes a deal with her that he ultimately does not follow through on his end of. Um, he tells her that if she sings for him, sh he will take her up into the sky so that she can see where her house is. And he, <laughs> he takes her to the beetle ball in which she has all of this outfit on because he's trying to disguise her and make her look like a beetle, right? So according to Biren, the eye of the insect responds to the yellow region of the spectrum, but not the red, and is sensitive to the green, blue, and violet, up onto the energy of ultraviolet, and so they prefer, they prefer blue overall. So she's wearing this white and blue with yellow and red accent dress, right? Um, but they can't see the red, and the red is, like I said, representative of happiness, and the, the yellow is joy. So she's out here, she's having a great time, she's performing, she's doing exactly what he said. She's getting all of this praise, which she loves, and she's, you know, wearing white performance. Um, but ultimately, when the costume comes off, um, they all tell her she's ugly, they tell her she's worthless, uh, they just insult her so much. And she's wearing all of this red underneath and it's revealed that she was only there for his happiness and she was only there because he wanted things from her and um they don't like that very much and she's very unhappy so she goes and she cries and all of these raindrops are representative of all those people's opinions and Giacomo blows them all away and is like listen you shouldn't care what other people think about you because Cornelius loves you, and you should care what he thinks about you. So, so far, she's learned from the Toads that, you know, not everybody's going to have your best interest in mind. Just because somebody says that they like you doesn't mean that they actually want to do good things with you. Um, and from the Beetle, she learns that everybody's going to have opinions of, of you, but you should only care about the opinions of people who actually truly care about you. Um, so now we get into Mrs mouse mrs field mouse and in the original fairy tale she's described as a gold good natured kind old field mouse um but then they proceed to show you all the reasons why she's not good natured um when thumbelina wants to leave she realizes that she can't because it would vex the old field mouse it would make her sad it would grieve her um and then when she tries to refuse to marry them all uh, Mrs. Fieldmouse threatens to bite her um, and basically tells her, listen, you better be grateful what you're going to get. You shouldn't ask for more. He's rich and that's all you should really care about. 
So here's Dawn Blue's version of the Spilled Mouse. Um, as you can see here on the very left, she's wearing all of these pinks, and as we've discussed, aren't warm colors good? But actually, as you can see in this image right on top up here, um, she's got this blue underskirt, and that is because she's hiding all of her selfishness and all of her bitterness about the world underneath this veneer of being, oh, I'm just a nice old lady and I'm going to take care of you. So right below that image, you can see Thumbelina in this like pink scarf. And that is given to her because Mrs. Fieldmouse is like, oh, I'm going to need you to stop being sad because I need you to seduce my neighbor. And she guilt Stumbelina into going over to her neighbor's house. Um, and on the right here, you can see all of her palette gets desaturated and the blue gets way stronger. And this is when she uh, sells Thumbelina essentially to Mr. Ball. Um, and this bright blue at the bottom here um, is when she's purposely hurting Thumbelina. She tells Thumbelina to sing her a sad song because she likes sad stories. And even though Cymbeline had already been sad and had already told her that she felt upset, she forces her to sing this song. And when she does that, her whole underskirt is visible, and you can see that it's this very bright blue. So this is Mr. Mole, and he's described in the stories as wearing a black velvet coat and being so rich, so learned, so clever, such a good scholar. But he's also described as being a spiteful and cautious and dull and disagreeable and stupid and tiresome and ugly and horrid and tedious and a terrible bore. So, we can see that he's got this Elizabethan rough for some reason. Um, but he's got his purples, his blue, his black velvet coat. Um, and he's got this really strong gold accent because he's rich and because Mrs. Fieldmouse tries to convince them, Lena, that the rich is going to make everything better. It's going to make her happy. It's going to make her, you know, fine for the rest of her life. Um, so this is the song that Mrs. Fieldmouse makes her sing, where you can see immediately the shift from her regular color palette into this much yellower one as she's recalling the sun. And it turns out the sun is a metaphor for Cornelius. And you can see how much her color palette warms up and her skirt turns this bright yellow. And this is not at all what, the, what Cornelius' color palette was before, but he's wearing it now. And, you know, they do this lovely little, ooh, look, we're dancing. And then as soon as she remembers that he's dead, her skirt turns blue and he starts wearing the colors that he's supposed to be wearing rather than the sensationalized gold colors he was wearing before. Um, and here we can watch her realize that she's never going to see him again. And those colors at the bottom are her skin and hair and it gets so much sadder, so much more gray toned as it goes along. Um, and then Mrs. Fieldmouse tries to convince her to marry them all, which is frankly awful. So right here with the blue hat and the purple dress, she's starting out going, you shouldn't care about love. Um, and then she tosses off everything that she's wearing and reveals that this under blue dress and that's her showing her intention she's going actually he's gonna make the both of us a lot of money and you better learn to accept it um, and then she puts on this pink and she puts on this white and she's performing she's selling this to her she's giving her a song she's like oh this is gonna make you happy this is gonna make you live out the rest of your days in comfort and this is when she starts talking about Romeo and Juliet, so we're gonna go from each of these color palettes, right? You can see the background change, but the colors that she's wearing stays pretty much the same. So, she's singing Romeo and Juliet. They were very much in love when they were wed, uh, and they honored every vow, and where are they now? They're dead. So, here, even though these two color palettes for the background are totally dissimilar, the thing that really, really changes is that she goes from wearing this white and this pink to being completely purple. 
she's doing this in order to scare Thumbelina. She's doing it in order to hurt her. And then she's like, oh, Thumbelina, you're just an idiot, and I'm telling you what's best for you. So this is how they end the song, where she's dressed Thumbelina up in white, she's convinced her, she's taken this thing that she was wearing, and she's put it on her head, she's, you know, dominated what she wanted and convinced her to her way of thinking. And that's going to be the end of that. So they go through the wedding, right? Um, And as we can see, her wedding dress isn't completely white, it's actually grey. But it has these strong yellow accents because, again, everybody's trying to convince her this is going to make you happy, this is going to be good for you. Um, But she gets reminders of Cornelius as she's walking down the aisle. Um, Her ring that he gave her, it's got this green stone in it, but it's turned blue here. Um, She sees him in the fire. And when she sees him in this reflection in the stained glass window, her color palette gets so much brighter. You can see her hair goes from here to here, and her her skirts go from these colors to these colors, and I think that's really interesting. So then she does, decides she's not going through the, with the wedding, and she confronts each and every person along the way. And as she goes, you can see at the bottom here, her color palette changes drastically. She's got these she, her like her inner skirt panel is the one that I'm going to look at the most so it's the second it's the third one from the left here it's a little bit gray green in the middle here when she's being confronted by Mr. Beetle it's turned this kind of brown gray and then you can't see it when she's fighting through this cobwebs but the cobwebs are symbolic anyway and she breaks through she gets away from everybody she finally sees the sun again and it goes from these drab grays to these warm grays and then the the center panel of her skirt goes from this yellow to this like orange toned brown and then back to this much much warmer yellow um and so she is going into the veil of the fairies and you can see the top this is a uh, her top part of her dress as it goes through you can see the two distinct points where she decides to believe so she's given up hope she's like i'm never gonna see him again he's never coming back and then she decides to sing and that's this yellow toned one and then she gives up again and Giacomo tries to convince her he's like no i need you to believe with me and it becomes this much pinker toned and then she goes let's be practical and it gets way more blue here the last one And then Cornelia shows up, and as you can see, this is her hair, her skin, and then her, the top of her dress. It's very pink toned here with gray, and then it's very yellow toned with blue, and then finally it's orange toned with this like peachy pink. And then she gets her very own wings, and that's because not only does she confront everybody in her past and make the executive decision that she's better than that and she doesn't have to settle she then chooses to believe in her own happiness and and then cornelius comes back and that's when she finally gets her wings it's not just about oh she gets the man that's not it it's her deciding to break free of all of the cycles and also believe in her own happiness and that's why she gets her wings So her mom comes back, it's very good because in a lot of the versions she just leaves home or she gets kidnapped away from home and she never talks about her mom again, but in this version she talks about her mom the whole time, she's trying to go back to her mom the whole time, and her mom is at her wedding, which I think is really important. And as you can see, you might be like, oh, but she's wearing all of these blue colors, what about that? It's because now Thumbelina has gotten through all of these people, she's learned all of these lessons, and none of these colors can hurt her anymore. So here's her wedding. It's very, very, very rainbow. Here's her and Cornelius getting married. And here's the end of the story. And they're immortalized in a storybook forever. And that's the color symbol of of Thumbelina. And here are all of my sources. Thank you so much. (laughs) 